It's not perfect. Okay, we're at the tail end of the day. Two more presentations to go. And the first of those is uh, by uh, Jens uh, Freiman yes. um, on Vert IO 1.1. What's new in the next version? Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, okay. So, yes, my name is Jens Freiman. I work for Red Hat. Um, and this talk is about the uh, recent Vertio work that we've been doing on extending the Vertio specification. Um, so the goal is to extend Vertio in a way to improve its performance and also to make it work better with um, workloads that it currently doesn't support very well. Um, so I'll give a very, very brief explanation of uh, Vertio and uh, just put it into context to uh, NFB very shortly. Um, before talking about the uh, main new topic in Vertio 1.1, um, which is uh, a feature called packed vert queues. Um, and eventually, if time allows, um, I will talk about a few other developments in uh, the space of Vert.io that I think uh, are worth mentioning here to this crowd. Um, but first, let's start with what Vert.io actually is. So Vert.io is an abstraction layer um, for devices and hypervisors, and the idea is to have a common framework for I.O. virtualization. And at its core, it defines virtual queues, uh, also a way to configure devices and mechanisms for backward compatibility. But I was quite good at that. Um, so there are many different devices. There are Vertor Net, Block, Console, and so on. And to a guess, these devices appear as normal PCI devices, or if you're on a mainframe, as channel devices. Um, Good. So, and to put this into context to um, NFV, so where in a possible NFV setup um, is better you're used? And I really just picked a random example. Um, let's say you're using a DPDK-based application uh, in your VM, and then you have a Vertio front end in the guest, and you have a Vertio back end in the host. Although in this case, um, Vertio is part of the DPDK library, and in the host, it's uh, part of the host user, in this case, also part of DPDK. Um, oh, and by the way, I guess most people are familiar with DPDK, but this is a, like a library and provides user space drivers and libraries to build um, fast package and uh, package processing applications. Um, so yeah, this is the part. <laughs> Talking about the value architecture, um, at the top, you see the device-specific components. This has everything that's specific to whether a net, block, and so on. At the bottom, you have the transport-specific parts. Um, as I said, devices can be PCI devices. They can be um, also CCW devices. That's uh, for mainframes. Um, but I want to talk about the uh, VertQ part today. Um, so. We want to add a, a new kind of word queues, and uh, so why do we want to do this? Um, the way word queues uh, are defined until value 1.0, and I'll call them split word queues from now on, as opposed to packed word queues. Um, they're not really fit for a straightforward uh, implementation in hardware. Um, so I've been expecting uh, hardware support for word for quite a while, actually, and it never happened. And um, well, I guess it's just because they're too complicated to implement. I know that uh, one company once uh, tried it and uh, stopped at some point. Um, and now there are several uh, companies that make an effort um, to push forward in this space and actually try implementing Vertio in, in hardware and make accelerators for it. Um, but not also hardware. Also, pure software implementation should benefit from Vertio 1.1 and the packed ring layout. Um, so what's the problem with the old way of vert queues, with split vert queues? Um, so this is what the data structures of it look like. Um, so first, each request is stored in a buffer in memory shared between the driver and the device. The buffer address and length are stored in these 16 byte descriptors, and they are stored in a descriptor table. Now, if the buffer is not contiguous, then multiple descriptors can be chained together by setting a next field in the descriptor. So 
where on the table to put each descriptor, that's up to the driver. And a request is identified by a head index, which is, six, which is a 16-bit offset into, uh, of the first descriptor in the table. Now, head indices are stored in the available ring. And to signal to the device which indices are valid, the driver also maintains an available index in shared memory. And after executing the request, the device will store the head index in this U string, which is uh, also in shared memory. Um, it also stores the length of the used part of the buffer, and it then increments the used index value in the shared memory um, to signal to the driver that this descriptor has been used. And um, So fundamentally, what we see is that host and guest communicate by passing messages um, between CPUs using shared memory. And how do CPUs do this? Um, so at a very low level, when a CPU accesses memory that is also modified by another CPU, this will cause the CPU to synchronize their caches. And they do this by exchanging cache coherence protocol messages. So basically, they speak to each other. Um, for example, for some architectures, when a CPU accesses memory that was previously accessed by another CPU, this will also cause a cache miss. And while well, the number of these cache coherence messages exchanged and uh, cache misses directly impact the communication latency. Now, let's count cache misses when using RADIO 1.0. The queue consists of five parts, and as a buffer moves between host and guest, each of these parts is read and written at least once. Um, so this is implying at least five cache misses per buffer. Um, if no batching is allowed. If we batch, then it gets a little bit better, but not too much. So what can we do to reduce the overhead? So the issue is that the information for this request is spread over multiple data structures, and this is causing multiple cache misses. So to reduce the overhead, we should pack as much information as possible into a single data structure. And what follows is a proposal to do exactly that. Um, this is currently being discussed on the Virtual mailing list, and um, there's a prototype for DPDK, uh, also on the DPDK mailing list. Um, we're working on QMU and Linux as well, but uh, DPDK prototype was there first. We started with DPDK. And so what we do is um, we get rid of the available and use string and the index structures completely. And what we do instead is we make the guest write descriptors out in descriptor ring order. And in our new descriptor ring. So within each descriptor, we add three new fields or flags, um, an available bit, a use bit, and a descriptor ID. Then to make buffers available to the host, the guest will write them into descriptors in our new ring. And then it will flip the available bit. This implies that it's now okay for the host to consume this descriptor. And the host can then process them in any order. Each descriptor also has an ID field, as I mentioned. And after processing, the host, host uh, writes the process descriptor ID um, back into the ring, and it flips the use bit. And by this, it's uh, telling the guest that an entry has been used, and then it can, uh, that the guest can use this again, or can make it available again. Um, so, device and driver are also expected to maintain uh, internally, not in shared memory, a single bit counter. And um, so starting at one and changing value each time, um, the last descriptor in the ring is accessed. It has to be flipped when the last one is accessed. And as I just mentioned, uh, these bits are passed as available and use bit in the descriptors. So assuming that the ring is zero initialized, on the first iteration over the ring, to mark the script as available, the available bit is set to one. And then on the next iteration, it is set to zero and so on. Similarly, to mark a script as used, the used bit is set by the device on the first iteration uh, to one, zero on the second one, and so on. So what do we uh, 
get by these counters? Well, flipping the counter values allows the host and guest to detect new available descriptors even after the ring has stopped. Because it could be that some descriptors were not touched in one pass of the ring because we uh, skipped them. Um, and this way we will know that this descriptor was made available and is currently um, uh, to be used. So, as I said, we have an implementation and I was um, measuring performance um, according to RC 2544. It was done on Intel-based servers. Um, host and guest uh, on the device under test were running RHEL 74. At the time, the patches were based on DPDK version 17.11. And the patches are now available on uh, GitHub and hopefully soon also upstream. Um, so apart from micro benchmarks, um, this is the only real test run I managed to do uh, before this talk. So um, with 64 byte packets, we measured uh, we measured a boost from 18.8 to 22.6 uh, Mbps. And well, this is using slow NICs, so larger packets simply Hit wire speed on the setup. And uh, I'm working on benchmarking uh, with larger packets. Um, um, so if someone is here familiar with uh, T Rex and uh, in combination with XL7 T10 uh, Intel NIX, then uh, please talk to me. I have some questions. Um, yeah. So I think we can conclude that uh, word queues as defined in uh, 1.0 are not an optimal data structure for host to guest communication and also not uh, perfectly defined for uh, an easy implementation in hardware. And we're trying to make this better with Word 1.1. On, well, by the way, if you uh, want to participate in Word IO or work on a Word IO specification or you have a new feature that you want to add, you have a new device that you want to add, um, this is actually quite easy and also fun. Um, you basically just download the specification source from GitHub. Um, you edit it, it's uh, LaTeX, so you have to build it, uh, uh, compile it, and look there to make sure it looks right. And once you've done this, um, you basically just um, subscribe to this Word.io common mailing list. Um, you have to reply to um, confirm your subscription, and then you can send your actual Sometimes it's a one-liner patch to um, reserve just the feature bit. Um, you send it to the mailing list, and if everyone's okay with it, then you send another mail and ask for a ballot. This ballot will run for, uh, for a week, and after two weeks, if all goes well, your feature is in the specification. Good. Um, so that's the part of my talk where I wanted to... Um, I was uh, going to talk about the weather of specification. Um, now I have some, actually, two things that I wanted to mention um, that I think are interesting. Um, so one thing is uh, a project um, initiated by Intel BDPA. It's called uh, Virtual Data, Pace, uh, Data, Data Pass Accelerator. And well, so better as a, a Terra virtualized device. You know, it decouples your VM and your physical devices, and that's nice in cloud environments because you can easily live migrate them and so on. But in terms of uh, north-south traffic, that doesn't compare to, for example, an SRIOV device, obviously. Now, this picture here, which is probably not easy to read, um, it shows how it looks without an accelerator device. And... Um, Intel is now working on um, a framework to make it easier to use a Word.io accelerator device. Um, so essentially, this will allow you to use hardware that can um, uh, write and read the Word.io V-Ring uh, format. And it will get you basically um, SLIOV-like performance in the, in the data path. Um, and the way they did this is, will also make it easier to um, basically um, switch from uh, a setup where you just use normal Word.io to one that um, support, that's actually using uh, an accelerator device. Um, so this picture includes the accelerator device. And as you can see, the control pass is still emulated. But this is not a bad thing because 
it's not performance critical. Um, but the data pass um, is now handled by this um, hardware device and that can write directly into the V-ring. Um, yeah, with traditional IO, you would usually do packet IO via shared memory and interrupts via IOQ of these and kicks doorbell via IO event of these. Um, backend then would be usually V host, kernel, or user. But with VDPA, that's a bit different. You have the uh, doorbell kick, and this could be, depending on your guest, either port IO based, or if you have a newer guest, then would be MMIO mapped. Um, interrupt notification here is done via PFIO interrupts, uh, like in password devices. And as I said, NQDQ to the reeling is done with the accelerator device. Um, it's also using VFO MDEF for address space access into the VM. Um, and the control pass is set up um, by vhost user protocol messages, basically. Um, also worth mentioning that here, it's currently not using uh, virtual IOMMU, um, but that's something we're looking into um, that should be improved. So, well, you might ask if you have a VirtIO capable device, why don't you just pass through the entire device to the guest? Um, and well, there's several reasons why you might not want to do this. And one is that VirtIO is a growing spec and things evolve in step and the hardware implementation uh, would have to keep up with the uh, uh, spec all the time. Um, it's kind of unlikely. Also, physical functions have a lot more um, features and metadata and so on that a virtual function doesn't really need to care about. You would inherit all the pass-through uh, properties and that includes also um, it's harder to live migrate um, without having vendor-specific solutions. Um, so, yeah, for example, in Virtual 095, um, you couldn't really pass through a device to the guest because all the register-based access was um, port I.O. based. And eventually, the major reason is um, that the nice thing about VDO is that you have a front end and a back end, and that's decoupled, and you can combine things. So the front end is often um, rather static, but in the back end, it's more common to have a choice of... Uh, the actual VirtIO backend. Okay, um, this is another project that's uh, currently uh, in the works. It's also um, started by Intel, and this is more about efficient east-west communication between virtual machines. Um, so imagine you have uh, a set of virtual network functions, like, I don't know, a firewall, intrusion detection system, router, whatever, and they need to forward packets to each other. You would usually put them into a virtual switch in the host and then packets gather there and are transferred one by one or to the target VM. And the downside here is that you have like a long code pass and um, it doesn't always scale very well. Um, but what if instead you could send packets directly from, uh, to the target VM? without going, having the data pass going through the host. Um, code pass would be shorter and it would be also easier to scale. Um, now the way this works here is that they have introduced a new set of vhost PCI devices that you have in the VMs and also a vhost PCI server in, uh, as a central component in one of the VMs. Um, and they are connected via Unix sockets and uh, they speak uh, the existing VOS user protocol over that um, to set things up. And stuff. So there's a presentation um, from KVM Forum about this. Um, there's also a recorded video on YouTube if you're more interested in this. Um, the current status is that there are patches on the mailing list and they are being discussed. There are still some design discuss uh, discussions and um, so the thing was that the way they wanted to do uh, this would also introduce a lot of code duplication, uh, especially in the vhost user part. So um, Stefan Heinochi um, suggested that they could use something uh, similar. Um, and okay, 
So bad I/O devices usually um, they're just you know you had your driver and a guest and you had an emulated device and QMU in a host user space process. And then as it evolved, you had um, so vhost user uh, vhost came along, which kind of um, allowed you to implement a part of the bad I/O backend in the uh, kernel and user space. Um, and then the next thing was actually vhost user, which would allow you to implement this um, backend in a user space process in the host. Now, Vedal vhost user is kind of taking this even one step further by moving the vhost device backend into the guest. And it works by tunneling the vhost user protocol over a new Vedal device type, um, which is called Vedal vhost user. Um, so yeah, the following diagram will show this. Um, so in this diagram, VM2 sees a regular Verdio net device. Um, VM2's QMU uses the existing VHOST user feature like if it were talking to a host user space um, VHOST user backend. And then Virtual Machine 1 QMU um, will tunnel the VHOST user protocol messages from VM1's QMU to the new Verdio VHOST user device so that um, guest software in VM1 can act as the vhost user backend. Um, now it's possible to reuse existing the vhost user backend software um, with better user since they use the same protocol, right? Um, now a driver is required here for the vhost, better vhost user PCI device. Um, um, so that code has to be written for that as well. And the vhost device backend vRings, they are accessed through shared memory and um, do not require vhost user messages to be exchanged in a data pass. So no VM exits are taken here. Uh, when pole mode is used, of course, uh, not at all. But even when interrupts are uh, used, then QMU is not involved here because we can use the lightweight IO event FD um, VM exits. Um, yeah, so Java can be implemented in the guest user space process um, using Linux VFIO uh, PCI, but uh, also guest kernel driver implementation would be possible. Um, also, the vhost device backend vRings, um, as I said, they are um, accessed just using shared memory. Um, it's also worth pointing out that this works for um, net devices, block devices, SCSI, and so on. Um, another thing, I think I might skip this here. Um, how much time do we have left? A little over five minutes. Okay, then I, I might just skip this. Um, or oh, one sentence. So this is just a new idea to do um, transparent bonding in a guest by, um, without having complex configuration by the user. So the idea is to just have a video device that has a special feature flag. And if this feature flag is seen in the guest, then it, we can go and look for another SRIOV device that we can bond with. And then we could have um, always used the fast data pass over the SRIOV device. And for migration, we could just uh, put the link of the SRIOV device down and then switch over to a video device do a migration and on the target system see is there another capable SRV device that we can use for data pass? And if not, we could just um, use the Vadeo device. So, yeah. Conclusion of my talk. Um, so Vadeo 1.1 will be a rather big release. Um, there will be many changes, um, mostly for the packed word use, but also some other things required for um, hardware implementations. Um, it's worth taking a look. Um, DPDK implementation is available. I didn't put the link in here, but it was in a previous slide, so you can look it up there. Um, also, if you're interested in this and uh, in participating, we have uh, like a monthly meeting, a monthly call, um, where we discuss these things, better one not one, but also better better your features. Um, you're welcome to join. Just contact me. Um, there's quite a few companies already involved. 
um, and you ones are always welcome. So that's the end of my talk, basically. Um, are there any questions? There's one. Yes. Um, so the question was, um, the implementation of Bellai 1.1 will require changes to QMU, and what's the timeline for that? Um, so right now, the next target is to get things um, upstream and DPDK, and we're at the moment already started to work on the Bellai implementation. So as a few months from here. Any other questions? Okay, then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jens. Uh, so, last talk of the day coming up now. Uh, in just a few minutes with uh, Pablo Camarillo. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> On segment routing V6 with VPP. Nice to meet you. So we are actually two speakers. So it's Samit and I'm oh, just right. playing Linux and I'm going to just play BBP. Okay. Let's try plugging this in. You may have a turn here in resolution down. Can we have that both? Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. I don't know. So we can plug it in. And we can plug it in. Just give it, give it a lot of time. Yeah, I'm sure there's oh, you need an adapter, you don't have a... No, it's just give it new Mac. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, in the Mannequin Piss Café, um, which is Rue des Grandes Carmes, I think, uh, around 7.30. So you're welcome to join us. Thank you. I'll, I'll warn you guys when you have 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You can use the full 30 if you want, if you don't want to take any questions. Okay. But So whatever I tell you, that's when the end of your 30 minutes. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, last talk of the day. And then you can go for beers. Um, so this is my colleague, Ahmed. Uh, he's a PhD student uh, from Italy, and I'm a software engineer at Cisco working in the segment routing architecture team. And today I'm here to talk about segment routing, which is something quite different from all the talks that we've been seeing today, because all of them were focusing on different platforms. And this one, what is focusing is on the actual protocols on the network, actually on, on SP networks. Um, so what I'll try to, to do is give you a brief overview of segment routing, the deployment use cases, and then um, talk a bit about BBP, Linux, and Sarah, which, which you will see later what, what it actually is. So what is segment routing? The idea behind segment routing is that we actually leverage the paradigm of source routing. So what does this mean? That instead of programming all the routers in the network, what we are actually doing is that on the head end, we are actually adding the list of segments that a packet has to traverse through the network. So what this means is that if I want to go from Madrid to Amsterdam via Brussels, what I just need to do is when my packet is out from Madrid, I just add one little segment that is saying, Brussels and then Amsterdam and the packet will follow the shortest path to Brussels and then it will go to Amsterdam. That's simple. And this is actually really scalable because what this means is that you can implement any traffic engineering uh, policy that you want and you can actually um, put this together with any NFV deployment that you want. And actually one of the main benefits is that we can have policies end to end. So starting from the data center and um, going traversing the entire network through the metro and one. So we have two data plane instantiations. One of them is MPLS, and the other one is IPv6. So in MPLS, what we are just doing is one segment is one MPLS label, and that's it. The second instantiation is IPv6. So in IPv6, what we are doing is we are using an IPv6 routing extension header, which it was defined 
15 years ago, and we have one segment is one IPv6.